are grateful to gather on the land of Treaty 6 territory and the care for this land throughout the centuries. We are all treaty people. We are proud to be an affirming ministry. Lent is a time to reflect and to risk. God gives us rest and also stirs us up. Lent is a time to face suffering and mortality. God hears our supplications and distress. Lent is a time to let go and prepare for new life. We present ourselves as an offering to God. Most sacred Mother, Father, God, we come humbly before you. We come with praise. We come with requests. Today we celebrate and rejoice in strong women of all faiths, cultures, and times. We pray for reformers and activists of the past, present, and future. We give thanks for our contemplatives and mystics who work and pray in silence. Great Spirit of the Universe, we listen to your voice as it comes through many siblings and cousins of our global village. We thank you for cultural diversity and versality of your divine wisdom in the world. We receive you in refugee camps. We hear your voice in displaced people. Pour in precious ointment of your love and healing upon our brokenness. Our brokenness, sorry. Connect us with all peoples of the earth Birth in us new thoughts and new worlds. May we be midwives of your sacred hope for humanity and for our beloved earth. Amen. May the light of life, the spark, of the Christ be ignited in you. Amen.
This first reading is a tribute to Violet McNaughton and Lotta Hitchmanova. March 8th is International Women's Day, a time in Canada to celebrate the achievements and lasting legacy of remarkable women like Lotta Hitchmanova, currently one of the eight nominees to appear on the new Canadian $5 bill. And Violet McNaughton, rebel, resistor, and rabble rouser for women's rights. Violet McNaughton settled on a prairie homestead in 1909 and became the face of the Saskatchewan campaign for women's right to vote. She devoted decades to advancing gender equality in the province's earliest years. One of the first women journalists, Violet advocated for women through her column in the Western Producer. She raised awareness for issues such as access to birth control and health care and the, and the quality of life for women and children on homesteads as well as the right of women to participate in the world outside the home. Lotta Hitchmanova was born in 1909, grew up in a Jewish, Jewish family in Prague, and was a journalist and an outspoken critic of the Nazis. She had to flee her Czech homeland in 1938. For four years, she was forced to wander about Europe, eventually finding her way to Marseille, France, where she worked with refugee support groups. She lost both of her parents in the Holocaust, and in 1949, sorry, 1942, after a 46-day voyage on the converted banana boat, she arrived penniless in Montreal with an unpronounceable name, feeling completely lost. In the depths of her personal tragedy, she could have given up. Instead, in 1945, she founded the organization to, hu to whose humanitarian mission she would dedicate the rest of her life, the Unitarian Service Committee, known as USC Canada. She had many nicknames, including the Soldier of Peace, for she was always wearing a distinctive army nurse's style uniform wherever she went. She was sometimes called the atomic mosquito. She never gave, uh, gave, sorry, she never took no for an answer. And by her sincerity and the force of her personality, she was able to gain the support of people from all walks of life, homemakers, farmers, civil servants, newspaper publishers, and even prime ministers. Her TV and radio public service announcements in the 60s and 70s were legendary and made USC Ottawa's office at 56 Spark Street the best known address in the country. But more than that, she pushed hard for women's development and for leadership training for girls and women around the world. Decades before this became a common approach of international development agencies. She also mobilized and empowered a whole generation of Canadian women who joined her cause and indeed made it all possible through thousands of volunteer hours that they put in. One testimonial goes like this. I can remember her voice so distinctly on the CBC Radio Noon program that my parents listened to in our very rural Saskatchewan home where I grew up. As a small child, I conjured up my own images of her work and was amazed how her work continued to influence, influence me in the years that my husband and I worked and lived in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Pakistan. Development starts with a woman. 
support leadership programs for women. Development often starts with a woman. Support leadership programs for women through the USC 56 Park Street, Ottawa. By using indigenous staff and working through local partner agencies, we are able to eventually work ourselves out of a job and move on to new projects. Scientists tell us there is no longer any excuse for human starvation. Yet two-thirds of mankind remain hungry while the world spends $150 billion a year on armaments. Won't you invest a constructive dollar in the fight against need and poverty? This is a reading from John. Since it was almost Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, while money changers sat at their counters. Taking a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, even the cattle and the sheep, and overturned the tables on the money changers, scattering their coins. Then he faced the dove and pigeon sellers. Take all of this out of here. Stop making God's house into a marketplace. The disciples remembered the words of scripture. Zeal for your house will consume me. The temple authorities intervened and said, What sign can you show us to justify what you've done? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. They retorted, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But the temple he was speaking of was his body. It was only after Jesus had been raised from the dead that the disciples remembered this statement and believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. According to the Gospel of John, the first public act of ministry that Jesus did was to turn water into wine at the wedding at Cana. How popular was that? Surely great things lay ahead. But soon Jesus seems to lose it. He causes a public outburst in the temple. He doesn't hurt anyone, but it must have been scary as he turned over tables and drove everyone out with a whip and then stormed out. Whatever happened to gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Didn't he know that anger is one of the seven deadly sins, according to the medieval church? How do we handle our own anger? Sometimes righteous over injustice. Sometimes selfish if we're just not happy campers. Let's take a look at that outburst of Jesus. Some see it as rejecting his own religion kind of an outburst against the temple and everything that went with it. 
But biblical scholars, John Crossan and Marcus Borg say the opposite. Jesus was engaging in a kind of spiritual civil disobedience to refocus attention on the prophet's message that God loves justice seeking more than worship, which somehow is complacent and blesses the status quo entrenching inequalities. Furthermore, Herod, um, the king installed by the occupying Roman powers had placed a large golden eagle, a symbol of Rome and its supreme divinity, Juniper, or rather Jupiter, on top of one of the temple gates. It was a sign of institutional submission to Rome. Also, the temple was not only home to religious objects, but also housed records of the debts that the people owed to their creditors, the managers of the temple, who were in charge of collecting loot from dispossessing small farmers, footing the bill for Roman extravagance. This is a formula for oppression we've seen throughout history, right? Different places, different times, different religions. So we're not singling out the temple. And even if religious institutions aren't actively collaborating with oppression, we tend to fall into comfortable habits. The comfortable pew, as Pierre Burton famously said. We could all use a shakeup from time to time. Theologian Phyllis Tribble says that a holy shakedown, a holy disruption is necessary about every 500 years. Kind of like a giant rummage sale where we just clear the house and make way for the new. You might wonder too, Jesus had a sharp wit. Couldn't some stand up comedy have accomplished his purposes instead of such a display of anger? There is a time for contemplative prayer and there is a time for holy disruption in the public square. God calls us to both kinds of witness, maybe even to comedy, stand-up comedy sometimes. Can you think of times when you've been stirred up about some kind of injustice or something not being quite right in the relationships you are in? Some people quit their jobs abruptly over this or leave relationships or retreat into depression, which can be anger turned inwards. It's hard to know what to do with our stirred up energy sometimes, isn't it? History gives us healthy examples of people who stir things up, who cause holy disruptions and inspire others to take up the cause. Like Lata Hitchbanova, nicknamed the atomic mosquito for her sound lights on radio telling us disturbing facts about people far away and buzzing around, getting us geared up into action. Like Violet McNaughton, daring to advocate for women's rights and for the vote. History has been hard on women who show anger, even righteous anger. And let's face it, none of us like to be the brunt of anger at home or in the workplace. Angry outbursts, even when we are stirred up for an important issue, can shut other people down. Marshall Rosenberg writes about nonviolent communication, where first we become aware, self-aware of feeling irritated, upset, angry, maybe some frustrated energies within us. Then we choose, we consciously communicate the issue and let another person know how their behavior affects us. Finally, we make a request of another person in a way that respects our feelings and those of the other. Sounds good, doesn't it? But in fact, most of us need lifelong training in the skill and there are sure no shortage of opportunities to practice. We all need an app for how to communicate anger in a constructive way, especially in the moment. Yet it's important to remember that our feelings of anger can be a vivid sign of caring. It's the opposite of apathy, of not caring at all. And I would argue, despite what the medieval 
church said that anger is not a sin. In fact, feeling anger calls our attention to something not being in right balance, to needs that must be addressed. How might God be calling you to how harness the power of anger in the work of love? To learn how to work constructively with the energy of anger, rather than turning it inwards into depression, self-medicating. There is a place on our Lenten journey for holy disruptions and for honoring our anger, our own and that of oppressed people, of speaking up rather than imploding. Let us pray. Passionate, compassionate God, sometimes we get stirred up when things aren't quite right. Help us honor our feelings as signals of caring. Help us learn ways to express the gift of what we are feeling. Sometimes you call us to stir things up when things aren't right. Help us to not erupt just because we're not getting our own way. Move us to disrupt when something must be protested. Give us blessed unrest to set things right. And give us rest and humor, especially at ourselves, when we need to relax and unwind. Thank you for making us and remaking us whole people gifted with feelings that make us alive and human and caring. Amen.
This service is bookended by two important world events. On Friday, we celebrated World Day of Prayer, the service being prepared by the women of Vanuatu uh, this year. And if you'd like to support the small development projects run by women all around the world that make such a crucial difference, you might Google the Women's Interchurch Committee uh, in Toronto. I believe the um, email might be www.wicc.org. And then of course, on March 8th, Monday, tomorrow for some of you, it's International Women's Day and, oh, we should be singing Bread and Roses. Please remember all the women whose um, sturdy shoulders we stand on, if you like, who've made life better and life even possible for some, like Lata Hitchmanova. We thank, we thank David Rain for information about Lata for today's service. And you can check out his blog dedicated to Lata Hitchmanova's memory at www.lata56 Sparks. Dot ca. Please check out our coffee chat on Wednesday morning as usual and Josie can send a Zoom link to you from our church office. Please join me in prayer. Gentle God, we know that you live within and around us. We are grateful. You know our struggles and our happy moments. Thank you, God. You know our sorrows and concerns. Here in this quiet moment, we remember and pray for those who are ill in mind and in body. And we pray for your energy to support living as fully as possible. Bring well being to all who suffer. We pray for those in our families and community who are helping us through this pandemic. For vaccines coming and rolling out, we can't wait to be part of the public good and getting into spring and summer and some normal life again. We pray for those who are bereaved. We continue to pray for Kristen Clark, for her grandchildren, Tia and Davion, upon the loss of their mother, Sabrina. Spirit, wrap your children round with warmth, with love. We cherish the sacred connections that bind us together and we celebrate enduring connections and partnerships, wishing George and Francis Sherbin a happy 70th, 70th anniversary of their marriage, wow. Congratulations, gentle God. We pray for ourselves that we may be a strength, a support and a spokesperson for our families, our community and our earth. Amen.
Go now with God's gentle but determined spirit. Provide care for your family and community. Be a prophet, a spokesperson for people and our earth. Go well.